This is the Occupy London protest camp in front of St. Paul's Cathedral in central London. They have a wide-ranging agenda here and have been portrayed as pioneers for a necessary movement or impractical and idealistic laughingstock. Now, what is it that they really want for Britain and how will they achieve it? People everywhere are starting to, to, to see. If you look at some of the recent opinion polls on, on their, you know, anyone's opinion of how the world is being run and, and what they think about capitalism, it's looking increasingly bad. What we have at the moment is a capitalism that by and large is predatory. It uses our savings, our pension funds and so on to gamble largely on the global markets rather than to create proper jobs. It's not very productive. Uh, it's long overdue for a complex overhaul. The current system is not broken. The supermarkets are still full of goods. The economy is growing, although slowly. The system works perfectly well. It just needs tweaking in order to improve. In mid-October, protesters descended on London's financial district, commonly known as the City of London, to emulate the Occupy Wall Street movement. They were prevented from camping in front of the London Stock Exchange, but got as close as they could and put up their tents. They've been living there ever since and holding meetings about the state of the economy and what policies should be adopted to help make it stronger and more sustainable. We visited the camp to speak to the protesters, starting with one of the organization's media representatives, Peter Vaughan. What is the idea? Why are you here? Well, this is about um, creating a hub where people can come and start debating, discussing ideas about our society and where we want to take it. Um, it's about understanding our society. It's about building a movement to challenge you know, the current powers in our society as well. What are you hoping to achieve? Um, for me, I think we've already achieved quite a bit. Um, the aim of this particular protest isn't to smash capitalism to bits in one, uh, one night and sleeping out in a tent. What it's about is fostering debate, and I think we've been able to have a space for debate for quite a while now. Why have you come down today, sir? Uh, because I agree with the ideas of the people here that the banks need to be regulated and uh, capitalism needs to be challenged. I've come down because I believe that the system that's currently in place is completely unsustainable and it's putting huge pressure on the environment in extracting so many resources from this planet. We live on a finite planet. It can't go on forever and we can't have continuous growth. You know, we've got a country which has um, unemployment which is reaching one million for, for the youth, 18 to 24, which is highest on record. We have the worst, one of the worst records for inequality in Europe, the worst record for social mobility in the world for any developed country. You know, these are, these are statistics which say that our society is fundamentally broken and, and, and unjust. And so this occupation needs to continue and it, and it needs to, you know, be successful. Well, uh, it was pretty tricky in the beginning to organize such a movement like this, but I think we did pretty well. As you can see around, we have a pretty good organization here. Um, of course, it's a work in progress, uh, but I think things are going pretty well. Well, I think normal people are worried about what's happening in society and it's good to give the message that normal people are, uh, are here and um, are part of this. In terms of other international Occupy movements, has there been any cross-fertilisation? Well, of course. I mean, in a way, there's always been a kind of informal conversation through the sense that we've taken their ideas and their kind of momentum from, and that's why we're here. But um, yeah, we're always in conversation with, especially with Wall Street. We have live link-ups and web streams. Uh, we had a uh, Hong Kong have just tried to get in touch with us through Skype. So, you know, it's very much a, a global occupation. The protesters and their supporters have often used stats from the New Economics Foundation, a think tank, to justify their arguments. The NEF aims to create growth by putting people and the environment first. James Meadway is a senior economist there. Does the New Economic Foundation have a position on the Occupy London protest? Well, what we say is that this is uh, an important series of events and a protest movement that, that, that's kicked off. It's a direct result of the kind of crisis we're in, which in the first instance is a financial crisis, and that it raises very, very 
very important uh, other questions about the kind of world we live in, about sustainability, about democracy, and about how we might reform and improve things, transform things even, to, to start living in a better, more democratic uh, society and economy. So yes, I, th I think we do support it. Uh, we've had people go down and do talks and have been, I think in some cases, even staying there overnight, uh, and lots and lots of engagement with that. Charles Orton Jones is a business journalist who has rather a less favourable view of the Occupy London movement. Well, I love talking to the guys at Occupy London. There's such a range of views, and you really can really come across some eccentric views. There's one movement called the Zeitgeist Movement, who want a centrally planned, resource-based economy where a central committee decide where all economic activity should be conducted, who should receive what, who should work where, it's the most ambitious piece of central planning I've ever heard of. It's um, certainly beyond anything the Soviets thought up. Would I want those people to run the country? Absolutely not. Um, you can also find various um, libertarian socialists along the lines of Noam Chomsky. I haven't totally been able to figure out how that one works. Uh, there are anarchist groups, right-wing anarchist groups, who think the government is too big, that we should not have bailed out the banks, we should have let them fail. That's something I can sympathise with. And that runs all the way through to left-wing anarchist groups who are paradoxically in favour of huge expansion of the government, um, expansion of the welfare state. So if you do go down there, you're not going to be short of opinions. Although the protesters have a range of differing opinions, the one view uniting them is that the current system simply isn't working and that politicians haven't done enough to fix it. James, is a common refrain. People say the system is not working. But what's wrong with the current economic model? Well, where to start with that one? Um, the, the first and the most obvious problem with it, and, and the one that's been, I think, driving a lot of the protests, is that it's not doing what it's supposed to do, even on its own terms. It's not creating jobs anymore. It's not pay, pay, making people better off or any happier, uh, despite years and years of, of claims otherwise. This debt fuel boom that we've had over the last decades when people went out and really didn't have much choice, actually, I think, but to, to borrow very, very large sums of money to really sort of try and maintain their standards of living. So it's not delivering in jobs. It's not delivering income. It's not delivering the kind of stability and prosperity that I think people want and I think that's one of the main claims against it. The second one's even bigger uh, which is that it, it's just not sustainable anymore. We can't carry on running a world where the Earth's resources are divided up competitively and no one takes a, a particular care over major aspects of those resources. So in particular, the, um, the, the possibility that by dumping carbon into the atmosphere that we're creating, the, the prospect of runaway climate change with very, very serious consequences for, for the population of the world, is something that I think is a direct product of the way the, the economy is being run that this is a competitive system, this isn't one where there's any degree of democracy or planning right at the very top of it, and that therefore it has a tendency to, to overfish, to overpollute, to overgraze resources, and that this tendency is getting worse. So those, I think, are the two interlinked problems with the current economic system. We live in a system which is manifestly unjust, and the camp we have behind us represents that unjustness and challenges us to think about what can be done to make capitalism more just uh, and our society more just. And, and possibly one of the most um, potent of the, the cause that we, come, that we hear from this camp relates to tax justice. They're attacking the City of London's role as a tax haven and as a, as, as a supporter of tax havens where wealthy people uh, avoid not just paying tax, but promote a deregulated economy which is systemically fragile, systemically prone to crisis, and systemically not creating jobs for young people. But even if the current system needs changing, what justification is there for a dramatic overall rather than just small modifications? Chris Bambury argues that the problems with our economic system run deeper than was first thought after the banking crisis. This is no longer a financial, uh, financial crisis. This is no longer even a sovereign debt crisis. So the sovereign debt, which you remember, was caused by nationalising the debts, the debts of the bankers in the first place. This is now a, a problem about actually the lack of any economic growth. If you look at, for instance, a country like Italy, one of the reasons why it's been thrust into the mire is not because it's got a huge financial sector. It hasn't. It's because for a decade and a half, it's been stagnating. We have economic stagnation in Europe, no growth and a danger of recession. And if the system is not growing and there's no sign of growth, and indeed there's a, an onset, I believe, of a, a fresh recession coming on, then actually we're talking about a systemic crisis. 
And if it's a systemic crisis, you do have to talk about overall alternatives to the system. It's not just a question of tinkering. What we have seen, it, particularly in Europe with the Eurozone crisis, is a lot of tinkering. Uh, a lot of tinkering which hasn't solved anything. As we speak now, uh, the, the, the rescue plan, the supposed final rescue plan for the whole Greek crisis, is, looks like it's coming, on, uh, coming unstuck. I think there does have to be a discussion about, if it is a systemic crisis, then what alternatives are there to this system? Uh, so therefore, it, it is a big issue. It's, a, it's the overarching issue of the, the 21st, uh, 21st century. Hasn't it always been that way? Just what are the alternatives? Well, no, capitalism has not always been like this. If you cast your mind back to the 1960s, capitalism was, first of all, much more responsible. It was creating better jobs, sustainable jobs. It was much more productive than the current version we have now. The idea that capitalism has always been like this is, is misfounded. Uh, what we have at the moment is a capitalism that, by and large, is predatory. It uses our savings, our pension funds and so on to gamble largely on the global markets rather than to create proper jobs. It's not very productive. Uh, it's long overdue for a complex overhaul. Well, the alternative is, the, is, is what's being talked about in the Occupy movement. I think there's a, a grasping after different ways of, of running the world that, that's, you know, I think people everywhere are starting to, to, to see. If you look at some of the recent opinion polls on, on their, you know, anyone's opinion of how the world is being run and, and what they think about capitalism, it's looking increasingly bad. And after many years where we were taught there is no alternative, I think we're seeing a, a lot of people at least wanting to try and find an alternative and discuss the alternative. Uh, on my part, I think it would have to involve uh, an expansion of democracy in, in how the Earth's resources are used, in the kind of jobs people have, in the, the way that they can control and set and manage the kind of lives that they lead and that's something that I think the Occupy movement has highlighted very very graphically by taking over spaces next to some of the major kind of technocratic institutions. What is the alternative? I would like to see us moving to reduce the amount of time that people work I'd like to see people being brought into, brought into the labour market to benefit jobs. I would cut money which is wasted on things like defence and use it for decent jobs, decent livelihoods in terms of services. I'd put this as a, 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 a priority at the moment. You know, so welfare, the welfare of our people and the welfare indeed of our planet should take priority over what's taken, uh, what has been the priority for the last 30 years, which is essentially the rich can get even richer at a fantastic level that the banks can do what they uh, do, uh, do what they like, and we have this huge expenditure on war, which is countries like Britain and America have been a permanent state of war really for the last three uh, three decades, and we should be questioning that as well. So, what would be so wrong with a radical alternative? The current system's broken, isn't it? The, the current system is not broken. The supermarkets are still full of goods. The economy is growing, although slowly. The system works perfectly well. It just needs tweaking, in order to improve. We've had exceptional growth for hundreds of years in this country. We have a situation where even the poorest 20% of people are massively better off than they were 30 years ago. In fact, they have a standard of living which my grandfather would have regarded as unattainable even for the richest people in society. So the idea that we need to go to some socialist system which has been proven again and again not to work seems to me ridiculous, which is really why so few people have turned up in London. One criticism of the Occupy London movement is that it does not have specific and achievable goals. Even they themselves admit that they have little to offer in the way of practical policy at this time. The very first point of their initial statement reads, the current system is unsustainable. It is undemocratic and unjust. We need alternatives. This is where we work towards them. But is this lack of direction really holding them back? You've said that there's no list of demands but goals. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Well, it's basically a, a statement of the current, our current intent, and it's, a, it's a, called an initial statement. It was agreed in the first few days of the occupation with a general assembly of 500 people, and it's a list which kind of catalogues what we feel is wrong with society. Um, it says things like the current system is unsustainable, unjust and un undemocratic. Um, you know, it, it's, it's talking about you know, all the issues that I've been talking about previously, about you know, the concentration of power and wealth, the injustice around the world. And so this is our kind of starting ground and we're working from that and always trying to revise it. But it's not a list of demands as such. One of the issues here is that nobody seems quite sure what the message is. Do you know what it is? No, I think it's... Uh, 
first of all, the, the, one of the messages which I think they have got across is we need to have a proper dialogue, a national dialogue about what we want from our economy, what we want from our society, what is just, what is not just, what respects people, what respects our environment. And I think they've done that because they've created this space within which a dialogue can happen. And I think it's fantastic now that we have a proper dialogue emerging with the church as well, that this, this is good news. So I think they've succeeded, but you know, as to whether they can articulate very clear demands, I don't think that's necessary at this stage. One thing that is clear, they are saying that, economic, that our economy is manifestly unjust, and virtually everyone I've spoken to in the last year has said exactly that. Our economy is not working for us as a society, so it needs change. The official narrative from the British government and indeed governments across Europe is there is no alternative to use Margaret Thatcher's famous phrase. We have got to accept neoliberal measures. This is it. We've got to accept austerity. Now there is a debate about what alternatives there are in this economic crisis and that's down to the people like those outside St Paul's. And if it hadn't been for people at the grassroots level taking initiatives like the Occupy London movement or indeed the Occupy Wall Street and the, re and the rest, this debate wouldn't have happened. It would have just been, sorry, we've got to follow austerity. Does this inability to grasp the nuances of economics and business make their arguments for change any less valid? It does make it less valid because on the whole they've been misled by some myths. For example, if you believe that the poor are getting poorer then you probably feel very energetic about reforming the system but it's just not true. If you actually look at the OECD data the poorest 20 percent of people have been getting richer in absolute terms over the last 30 years. If for example you believe that we gave the banks 850 billion which is a figure I've heard reproduced then yes, you'd be running down to London with a placard tomorrow. I'd be joining them. It's just not true. We didn't give the banks that amount of money. In fact, as Tim Harford, the FT's undercover economist, points out, the UK taxpayer may make a profit on their investment in the banks because we bought shares in RBS and Lloyds Banking Group at the bottom of the market. We picked them up for peanuts. And when, in say five or ten years' time, the world economy has improved and we're able to sell on those shares, we may recover all of the money we directly invested. I think a lot of people at the Occupy London protests don't understand these figures. They have been led astray by myths. So many of the things they're campaigning against just don't exist. Some of the protesters taking part in this have been accused of not fully understanding economics or business. Is there a level of naivety here? Well, I think it's a bit rich, if you pardon the expression, coming from people, for instance, economists and bankers who presided over this crisis. And it was the financial experts who got us into this situation. And I think there should be a little bit of humility in the city of London or on Wall Street. But there isn't. They're continuing to take their bonuses. We see corporate pay for cheap executives mushrooming one, uh, one, uh, once again. And therefore, the people that presided over this uh, mess don't seem to be able to eat any humble pie. They got us into this mess. This is where the Occupy London protesters originally wanted to be, in the shadow of the London Stock Exchange. But because it's been closed off to them, you can see the police in the background there, they've had to decamp around the corner to St Paul's, which has caused no end of trouble. The camp spent weeks in the news headlines, not for its principles, but for its conflicts with St. Paul's Cathedral, which closed its doors for several days amidst fears for tourist safety. The church struggled with what position to take, as despite being sympathetic to the protesters' message, they were also desperate to be rid of the tents, costing them valuable tourist revenue. Two officials from the cathedral resigned amidst concern that any police intervention could lead to violence. Eventually, the church decided to back the protesters and let them stay. It now looks likely that the camp will survive for several more months due to the tenacity of the protesters and the sympathy of the public. Are you disappointed that you couldn't be outside the London Stock Exchange? I think we're pretty close. You know, everyone can, you can see the London Stock Exchange. The the square to the London Stock Exchange has been shut permanently for the last uh, two weeks. So, uh, you know, in a sense, we've achieved our goal in, um, in occupying both the Stock Exchange and the area surrounding it. Um, and I think more than that, this is about symbolism. It's not about the practicalities of shutting the Stock Exchange down. Are you in support of them staying for as long as it takes? I think so. I mean, if they've got the courage to do it, it uh, must be get pretty cold here, I should think. 
It's been quite all right, the weather, for the last week, but it'll get cold in the next few weeks. But if they, if they can, can do it, that's really good. I'm just a passerby. I work in an office near here, and I came down to find out what was going on. And I'm really impressed by how well organised this is. And I don't see why everybody in the City of London and St Paul's is making a fuss about it. So you would not be in support of moving them along? No, not having come to see how it is. What will be the reaction if the authorities attempt to move the protesters along? Uh, the reaction from us? Well, I think people want to stay. They've said time and time again that, you know, this is, everyone feels this is an important occupation and, you know, th there's no reason for us to leave at this, at this moment, so we're staying put. We have agreed to resist peacefully, um, absolutely peacefully, and that's been agreed by consensus, so but resist you will. Yes. The Occupy London camp has provoked strong views regarding their right to protest in this manner and in this location. But their grievances reflect the public mood. The movement is symptomatic of an anger with the economic system that many people find difficult to articulate. The national conversation that the protesters are hoping to start could help to better educate the country about economics empowering them to hold the government to account in the future. And this would be no mean accomplishment. Will your presence change the inequality? I hope so. I think, you know, it's, it's only the start at the moment. And, you know, we can only hope that through our, through our work here that, you know, we can start to challenge um, some of the fundamental power bases in our society and the inequality fundamentally. Um, but it's only achieved through people coming here and people providing their skills and people just having real discussions and real debates and I think we've started that you know we have horizontal organization where there are no leaders no one person telling other people what to do because they're in a position of authority and this is you know this is about the change we want to see is here in this camp you know it's about opening up and having more democracy and so I think that you know the camp in itself is one of the kind of answers we're trying to say that we want. Do you understand why this issue raises so much passion on both sides of the debate? It does and it should and for many years people have overlooked the importance of financial services in the UK economy and it hasn't been properly debated. In fact during the 2000s the IMF issued five warnings to Gordon Brown as Chancellor saying that we had a housing market that was overinflated, that we had potential inflationary pressures in the economy and he was able to dismiss them all because very few people, either journalists or members of the public, were interested in economic or financial affairs. So I'm excited by the fact now that ordinary people are discussing business and economics. I think it will be healthy in the long run. People are asking their MPs what they're doing about the banking crisis. People are actually going onto the National Audit Office website, pulling off some of the reports and reading it. I have friends who have no interest in economics whatsoever discussing the banking reforms. I think that's brilliant. Only, only good can come of it. Why is there so much passion about this issue on both sides of the debate? I mean, we're British, we don't do passion, do we? I think you've seen this building up all year. I think at least since the, the student protests, um, almost a year ago actually today, over November and into December in 2010, uh, that you've seen people becoming increasingly concerned about the state of the world and in particular the government's response to what is now very obviously a very very serious essentially epoch defining crisis of capitalism that's what's driving the passion one way or the other you know it's forcing a decision on people are you for or against what's taking place are you for or against uh, the cuts the austerity that this government wants to introduce and governments right across Europe are you for or against ultimately the way capitalism operates this is the sort of thing that ought to rouse passions in people because the answer in the end will determine the kind of world we live in over the next few decades.